Um, with that, this is our first Women's Assembly in the new year. So happy new year to everyone. Really excited to be back. Um, we've got some really cool sessions coming up. All of the upcoming sessions and guests that we have are up on the website. So you can check that out. And I really hope I'm crossing my fingers. I'm going to do my best, ladies, to deliver on this, but I'm hoping that by the next Women's Assembly, I have some legitimate information to provide you in regards to the Women's Summit, the in-person event that we're trying to host in 2023, in partnership with uh, Jenna Lee, who's our co-founder's wife, uh, who runs a really incredible uh, program called Smarter News, and she provides really quick, easy, unbiased news um, and it's really, she's, she's phenomenal. And she has this incredible story around how to create your own story, how to write your own story. In addition to some potential guests that you guys have seen on the Women's Assembly, we're going to look at putting uh, our heads together and building a summit, like a two-day experience. We're kind of playing around with the idea that it'll be called the long weekend, uh, where you guys can come and um, be a part of some training and some development, but also just some camaraderie and hanging out and socializing, which will be awesome. So hopefully more to come on that soon. Um, with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Meg. For those of you joining us the first time, welcome. Um, it's We're gonna go through some content today. We've got a topic that Meg's gonna talk about. I'll give some additional insight. And then if you have questions or you have challenges that you're facing, use that chat function, throw in in all caps question, and put a question there so we can find it easily and we will go through that. If you don't wanna ask your question to the group and you want it to be anonymous, you can direct message that to me or to Meg Miller on our team and we will uh, state the question and walk through it without giving who you are away. If you have a question, maybe you don't want people in your office to know about anything like that. So go ahead and um, use that chat function and we'll go through some questions and kind of keep it more interactive. And then for anyone, that um, can't stay on the whole time, or you have friends or family that weren't able to join, or you wanna share this after the session, you do get the link to the full video um, of the content uh, within 24 or 48 hours. So you'll get that email to you and you can share that accordingly. With that, in case I missed anything, but I'll pass it off to you, Meg, to, to cover down and then go into our topic today. Awesome, thanks, Jamie, I think. Uh... Good with the questions. If you have situation reports, sit reps, you can also add those to the chat box so you can capital sit rep. And then any you know updates that you have, we love hearing from you. We love those sit reps. I know the community does too. So feel free to drop those in the chat as we go. So today's topic is uh, apologizing versus ownership. So an interesting one and one that's come up a couple of times, I think with the uh, different clients that we work with, and actually one that Jamie suggested for a part of the Women's Assembly. So I was like, cool, I'll, I'll take that one on. Um, and it was a really good experience for me to really kind of think about what is the difference between these two? You know, how are they the same? How are they, what similarities do they share? How am I using them? How am I not using them? Um, and what situations? So we'll talk about that today. Um, but like I said, apologizing and ownership can oftentimes have a lot of crossover. You know, they're both a recognition of fault, right? So this is a, a similarity that we know. Um, that's really what we're saying is, hey, I messed this thing up or I'm sorry, I apologize for this uh, error that I made, right? But that recognition, that fault, that mistake requires us to be humble. It requires us to be able to check our ego to be able to reflect and look on any situation, any of the various situations that we find ourselves in, and really pull that thread back to ourselves. Really thinking about what was my role in this situation? What was my contribution? Where did I mess up? Where did I go wrong? And taking ownership of that thing. So it requires that humility. It also requires us, you know, that piece about detachment, being able to detach from our emotions, being able to recognize, hey, I need to really assess honestly what I did in this situation, you know, what I, what impact I had, what impact my actions, my behaviors had, and that humility piece and that detachment piece is huge. So in both of those apologies and ownership and last similarity that I wanted to talk about or mention was one actually that uh, comes up oftentimes in one of Jamie's briefs called the barriers to extreme ownership. And the first barrier that she mentions in this brief is this idea of um, the fear of, you know, not being respected or the fear of this being seen as a weakness. And I think in both of these cases, apologizing and taking ownership 
can sometimes be perceived as a weakness. But the reality is, and we know this to be true, right? If we're given two leaders, we have leader A, who something's gone wrong, but leader A is someone who just kind of averts their eyes, maybe looks down in a meeting, doesn't say anything, doesn't take any ownership. Versus leader B, who steps up, takes ownership, hey, that was my fault, that's on me. We know who we have more respect for in that situation. We know that it's leader B. It's the person who steps up, who recognizes their fault, who admits to that fault, who takes ownership, we have more respect for that person. So this barrier of this like fear of it being seen as a weakness is unfounded. We know that we know that there are ways for us to move through and that's through taking ownership and implementing solutions. And apologizing is actually something that Jocko talked about in leadership strategy and tactics. So I wanted to read just a little bit of the blurb um, about what he says, and then I'll kind of tie this into some other ideas here. So for anyone who's curious, this is on page 294 and LSAT. There are some leaders who think apologizing is a sign of weakness, but that is usually because they are weak and insecure about their leadership position. There is nothing wrong with apologizing when you make a mistake. That is part of taking ownership. This is especially true in relationships where you have done something that had a negative impact on someone. You left them out, overlooked them, or otherwise disrespected them in some way. When that happens, Apologies are completely acceptable. Actually, an apology is more than acceptable. It is the right thing to do. If you're apologizing because of a decision that was made, then the apology must be accompanied by an explanation. Explain to the team why you did what you did, what you saw, how you read the situation, how you anticipated the decision would work out, what actually happened, and how you will prevent yourself from making the mistake again. Then apologize for making the mistake as long as you mean it. Don't apologize for every little slip up, not because it is bad to apologize, but because it is bad to apologize if there is nothing really to apologize for. So I think there's a lot of good stuff in, you know, that little portion that I just read there. And some of the things I wanted to touch on, you know, was when we think about apologizing, we think about ownership. What is our intent? What is my intent when I apologize? And as I thought about this question, I'm thinking about different situations when I apologize, and a couple things came up for me that I do or have done in the past. And one of those is say, sorry to bother you. One of those is to say, sorry to ask so many questions. And one of those is to say, sorry for the delay. And I'm thinking to myself, what is my intent by saying that in these situations? Am I truly sorry that I recognize the fault? Am I truly sorry? And the conclusion that I came to was that it's actually not about being sorry in those situations. It's about that I don't have a good, strong relationship with that person. If I had a good relationship with that person, I wouldn't need to say, sorry to bother you, because I would know that, hey, they're, they're going to have my back. They're going to support me, something I need, regardless of how busy they are. If that good relationship is in place, I don't need to apologize for that. It's not a slip up. If I am late on something and I have a good relationship with someone, they're gonna give me the benefit of the doubt. They're gonna be like, oh, hey, Meg's usually on, on point with this. She's usually on time. She must have a bunch going on. Let me see what I can do. And if I apologize for asking so many questions, if I have a good relationship with that person, whether that's my boss, my peers, my colleagues, whoever that is, I want them asking me questions. I want to make sure that I communicate effectively. I want to make sure that we're aligned so that we're all working towards the same mission so that they're able to execute. I'm able to execute on what I need to. So in those situations, my intent behind apologizing doesn't really make sense. It's not something that I need to be apologizing for. I need to be working on building that better relationship so that we can keep pressing forward and keep moving that mission forward. The other thing that I want to mention here that Jocko talks about and that I read was our impact. What is the impact that we're having? What is the impact that our actions, our behaviors, our decisions have? And we got to be able to evaluate that impact. We got to be able to recognize what that impact is. And it can be a spectrum of things. It can be something small where that impact isn't really, you know, uh, super negative. It's not really a high impact situation. I was at the airport this morning and I was uh, putting my bag on the, you know, scanner to get it ready to go through. So 
I put my bag on there and I stepped a couple feet away and the attendant was like, hey, come back. You can't leave your bag yet. I was like, oh, sorry, my bad. So easy, low impact, right? Simple situation, apology, cool. Situation's good. My bag got on the thing, we're good to go. Sometimes this happens when we're out on site with a client. I thought I heard the name Lila. Turns out her name was Kyla. Oh, hey, sorry, that's on me. My bad, Kyla, got it moving forward. Right. So those are kind of those low impact situations where, you know, apologizing might make a little bit more sense. But when we think about those high impact situations, we think about those situations where what we did really affected someone else in a negative way. We got to take ownership of those. We got to own our behavior. We got to own what we did there. We talk about the framework for taking ownership. And for those of you who haven't joined the Academy, we have a great course on Dave and Jocko talk about how to take ownership. They walk through this framework step-by-step. Step. It's a free course, so I encourage you to go on there. But one of the steps that we talk about when we say we're gonna you know, kind of go through this framework of taking ownership is the idea that we describe the impact. We describe the consequences to whoever that person is, whether we're talking to our spouse, a peer, a team, uh, our boss, our ability to recognize our impact allows us to take ownership. It really helps the other person understand like, oh, you really do see what you did, how it impacted me. Now, we don't have control over other people. I can't control how Jamie is going to respond to something, but I can control my reaction. I can control my response, and I have to take ownership of that impact. So I, a couple of years ago, I was, um, I found myself in a situation where I needed to take ownership because the impact was, it was pretty negative. It was pretty bad. So I um, didn't communicate to my boss and I was going away for a couple of days. The players on my team had decided that they wanted to kind of run a captain's practice. And so I didn't share that information with my boss, who was athletic director. I was like, oh, it's no big deal. It's fine. You know, like the players will be fine. No big deal. So come to find out that there were some weather related issues. The players go to the athletic director because obviously I wasn't around. And the athletic director was caught off guard. My boss was caught off guard. She's like, wait, what? You guys are practicing? What's going on? So I didn't set her up for success. I put her in a tough position with the players. I didn't allow her to be able to make, you know, adjustments or sort of prepare for some potential situations. And I put the players in a really tough spot. They were like, hey, coach, we kind of expected that you would have shared that information, right? So I put both of these um, kind of groups into a really tough spot. The impact of that was certainly on the relationship, um, both my relationship with them as well as their relationship with each other. And you know, in kind of other areas that the weather, that some of those other decisions that the athletic director would have had to make also affected those other people. So this is an area where I want to take ownership of this whole thing. I want to make sure that I make it crystal clear to my boss that I recognize I messed up. I'm at fault. My, my poor decision-making not to share this information, I see how this impacted you. I see that I put you in a bad position. I see that I didn't help you prepare for some contingencies. I see that I put you in a bad spot with the players. And that's 100% my fault. So when we talk about taking ownership, we are not, uh, we are making it crystal clear to the other person that we're talking to or other people that we're talking to that we own that whole thing. Not, I'm sorry, but not, this is kind of my fault. We want to eliminate any of those qualifiers and own that whole thing. And our ability to own that whole thing also relies in providing a solution. So in this situation, hey, boss, I didn't communicate this to you. It's 100% my fault. I see how it impacted you, put you in a tough spot, put the team in a tough spot, didn't give you the information that you needed to really you know, be set up for success. So moving forward, if this situation arises again, I'll make sure I communicate and I'm gonna be sure to communicate any schedule changes to you so that you have awareness so that we can put any contingencies in place that may need be just based upon weather or any of those other factors. So those steps in taking ownership really allow that person to hear 
Okay, Meg does get it. She sees the impact. She's owning this whole thing. Now, if I don't complete this fifth step, and this is a critical, crucial component to really taking ownership, if I don't complete this fifth and kind of final step of taking action, I have to take in action. I have to implement that solution in order for me to really show that I recognize my fault, that I recognize that my decision wasn't a good one and I wanna change it. I wanna change that behavior. I wanna change things moving forward. I wanna implement this solution so that problem gets solved so we can keep moving the mission forward, whether that's at work or whether that's at home. These principles, we know that they apply everywhere. But when we take ownership, we have to utilize that fifth step. We have to facilitate that implementation and facilitate that solution. So for me, you know, as I kind of think about this and really the, the outline of the difference between apologizing and taking ownership, it comes down to that action piece. It comes down to not leaving the door open for any doubt that I see where I messed up, that I see where this had a negative impact, that I see where this was my fault. I'm gonna own that whole thing and I'm gonna implement those solutions. And by taking ownership, that actually gives us, it's very liberating and it gives us a ton of power. It gives us the power to solve problems. It gives us the power to change things. It gives us the power to make our lives and the lives of the people around us better. And that's what we want. And it gives us the power to move our missions forward, our missions at work, our missions at home. It gives us the ability to be able to do that because we're solving problems. And when problems go away, good things happen. Not to say that more problems won't come up, but when problems go away, we're solving those things. We're getting to them early. We're having that uh, ownership. We're taking that ownership and we are moving that mission forward. So I think uh, apologies can, can work in some circumstances, but really the ownership is allowing ourselves to take action, to admit our fault, which is hard to do. This you know, kind of step of saying, hey, that's 100% on me. That is a blow to our ego. Our ego doesn't like it. Our ego loves us. Our ego doesn't like to say, hey, I messed this thing up. But when we're able to do that, when we're able to genuinely and sincerely kind of pull that thread back, see where we, where our role, where our contribution was to this situation, we own it and we change our behavior moving forward. That's where a lot of the gold is. That's where a lot of this ownership makes a huge difference in our lives and the lives of the people around us. Jamie? I think love it. Got. Yeah, no, I love it, Meg. This is, um, this topic came about because I was actually on site with a group of women at this organization. It was a women's uh, conference for this particular organization. It was their women in leadership program. And I called Meg after the session because I have this really interesting interaction and a question I had gotten, I had not gotten before at a client site, which is pretty rare. We get a lot of this very similar questions. We get, you know, pretty comfortable in answering certain questions, but this question kind of threw me off initially. And so real time, I had to think about how to answer this question for this woman, because what she was saying was that throughout her career, um, as a woman who was driven and wanted to win and wanted to climb the ladder and really wanted to prove herself in this industry, she was always told by other women and other mentors of hers that, hey, if you want to succeed and you want to be taken seriously here in this organization and in this industry, don't ever apologize. Never apologize. And it threw me back for a second because I thought, well, wait a minute, what, what do you mean? And so she was what she was explaining was that she was having a little bit of a hard time really understanding and, and taking on board this idea of ownership because it was conflicting with this mentality she's had throughout her career was that, hey, if I'm a woman, if I'm a woman in this industry and I want to differentiate myself and prove myself, I can't apologize because that makes me look weak and people will undermine me and take advantage of that. And it makes me, it, it shows a lack of confidence if I'm talking and communicating with my staff. And she gave me some examples and Meg hit on some of those. And I, I didn't really disagree with some of her examples. Things like, hey, I'm sorry for the delay, changing that to thank you for your patience. Um, that's fine. I think the way that we change some of those little ways in which we communicate to show a stronger sense of 
purpose and intent is totally fine. But you could tell that there was a real conflict for her between this idea of saying I'm sorry and apologizing as opposed to what we were teaching, which was ownership. And so as I thought more about that and I called Meg and we talked more about it, I realized that there is one really big difference between the two. And Meg hit on it exactly. It's action. It is 100% your ability to take ownership of something and solve the problem. Apologizing and saying I'm sorry gets us nowhere. It's just simply lip service. It's just saying the words and taking the opportunity to say I'm sorry. And, and I'll give a caveat to that in a moment, but in the broad scheme of things, for the things that we're saying I'm sorry for on a regular basis, and for those of you that have kids, I, I have a 14-year-old who's very quick to say sorry, and everything's like, Ugh. like I don't even believe it anymore. Sometimes I laugh, and I'm like, but you're not sorry, because you just did it yesterday, and he, we, we have a lot of conversations around saying I'm sorry and what that means, and to Meg's point earlier about the intent of that and using the phrasing, I'm sorry, and making apologies that way. Ownership is what gives us the ability to actually act and solve problems. Ownership is a lot different than saying my bad, I'm sorry, uh, my fault. Ownership and what we teach around ownership is saying, this is my fault. This is how I contributed to this problem. And more importantly, the biggest part of ownership is this is how I'm going to solve that problem and ensure this problem doesn't continue to persist. That gives us control. That gives us confidence. That builds respect from the people around us when we take ownership and then we actually solve the problem. And the one caveat that I will give you is that there is a time and a place for apologizing. And that time and place is when I have done something to in interrupt a relationship with someone that I care about, someone that I need to have a solid relationship with in order to accomplish the mission with my kids, with my spouse, with my colleagues, with my leadership, there are times that if I have done something to impact our relationship and cause friction, there is absolutely times where the words, I'm sorry, matter in that situation to mend that relationship. But even in that situation, I'm sorry does not fit the entire bill. I'm sorry is, is an important phrase to use in mending that relationship, but right behind it, very quickly behind it, has to come the ownership. This was my fault, and this is what I'm going to do to solve this problem. I was on site with a client uh, just this past week. I was in an, uh, an event, I think it was Atlanta, um, wherever I was on Tuesday. <laughs> I, was on, I was on site with a, a client. And it was, uh, it, it was not a women's leadership conference, but the majority of the people that were at this company in this particular industry are women. Um, and this one woman kind of raised her hand and she had a similar question. It wasn't so much around apologizing and ownership, but this, this sense that, and what she actually said to the group was, I understand the idea of ownership, but it just doesn't feel good. And she had this feeling of like, ownership doesn't really feel good. It's like, you know, to, to Meg's point, we have to fight against that ego and it, that can create a barrier to our ability to see the power in ownership. And what's interesting is that my instinct was actually the opposite of that. I kept thinking about a scenario in which I wasn't willing to take ownership and how that made me feel at, on edge and angst and, and that sense of un, un, unrest. Um, and so we started talking about this idea of, of ownership and, and the power and the control that it gives us to solve problems. And this, this young woman, um, she brought up a scenario in which she has a member of her team, an admin assistant, who she has a great relationship with, and she has a ton of trust in, and she wants to see this girl, you know, continue to evolve and get better and, and elevate in her positions. And she has the best of intentions with this young woman. But there was a disconnect and she was feeling a little frustrated because this young women kept coming to her to ask her questions related to their job and questions that this person felt like she should be able to answer on her own. These are like seemingly simple, easy questions. And she was just feeling a little frustrated because she's like, I just don't get it. She keeps coming to me for these things, but like I trust her and I just want her to feel confident enough to make those decisions. And we were in front of this whole group of, you know, 50 people. And so I just started asking earnest questions and I'm not gonna go through the whole role play scenario with her, but there was a moment where we kind of asked some questions and she kind of started to piece together that, 
you know, she always gives her the answer. She's the easy button. She hasn't trained her. And she's, we've kind of pulled out some of that through these, through these earnest questions. And then she says to the group, well, yeah, it's probably my fault. And, you know, she's kind of tense and you can kind of see it in her face and she's not super confident in it. She's like, yeah, no, it's, it's probably my fault. And she's wishy-washy. And I was like, Jen, stop, take out probably, take out the word probably and try that again. And I'm, I'm being encouraging. I'm not trying to be, you know, put her on the spot. We're having fun with it. But she legitimately took a breath and said, you're right, it's my fault. And her shoulders relaxed and her face relaxed and her, her grimace and her confusion changed to a little bit of a smile and her eyes opened up. And I called to the group. I'm like, what did you guys just see? And we pointed out the change in her demeanor, the whole change in her countenance around this situation. And I was like, Jen, what are you feeling right now? And she's like, I've now switched my mindset to what I can do to solve the problem. And she went through four or five things that she started thinking through, you know what, like I trust her, but clearly she doesn't know that I trust her because she's still coming to me for these things. I need to ask her that question. What do you think we should do? I need to turn that back around her instead of being the easy button. I need to actually put some parameters in which, hey, it, with it, things within this box, you can make that decision and I've got your back. If it's not the right one, we'll talk about it and I'll give you feedback. Outside of that, you come to me and I'll help problem solve that with you. And within a few minutes, everything changed. She's coming into this feeling like this doesn't feel good and it's kind of my fault and I don't really know what I can do about it. And there was a, a clear lack of confidence. And within a moment, just by taking out the word probably, she relaxed and she was detached and she saw a pathway for, okay, once I get over this barrier of my ego that's trying to convince me that it's not really my fault and you accept full ownership, she moved into how do we solve the problem? And how empowering is that for leaders in every capacity, but specifically women, to be able to walk into a situation and see how they can take ownership of a problem and then turn that into ownership of the solutions. That's where we get confidence. That's where we get control. That's where we get the freedom and that liberation that we talk about with ownership is when we just get over that initial barrier to take full ownership. And apologizing, and I'm saying I'm sorry, is a step in that direction, but you're not fully getting over that barrier until you recognize your full ownership in the problems and situations that you're dealing with in every capacity, at home and at, and at work. So I think what it, what it taught me, and, and this is why I love going on site with clients, this is why I love these sessions, because I learned so much in preparation, in hearing my colleagues talk about that, and through talking through these problems, I learn, and it solidifies for me my belief that ownership is legitimately how we solve every problem that we're facing, that leadership is the solution to everything. Um, and I just wanted to share that as an example, because I think too often we're on the other side of that barrier. And, you know, we're saying, I'm sorry, we're apologizing. And as you guys know, if we're not do if, if we're doing that without action, if we're doing that without ownership, it means nothing. So there is a place, a time and place for using the words, I'm sorry. There's a time and a place for apologizing. There's some politeness in that. Meg gave some examples. Hey, oh, I'm sorry if I, you know, hit somebody walking through the airport, whatever that might be. Saying I'm sorry in those instances is perfectly fine. But the real power is ownership and the real ability to solve those problems is ownership. And that's the difference between saying I'm sorry and taking ownership. It's the action piece and the ability to then solve the problems that is so critical. So I love this topic today. I think you did a great job outlining some things for people to think about, Meg. Um, yeah, I just get fired up. This is so exciting. This ownership piece, I promise you, promise you, if you just get over that barrier, you'll see the same thing that this young woman saw in that short instance of the power of actually saying, okay, this is fully my fault. Um, so I love that.